Excellent. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name's Sam. I work for the ACT Government Inventory and Protection Unit, and I studied under Chris and Jeff back in the day here in the forestry degree. Um, so I'd like to welcome you tonight, Chris, uh, Honorary Associate Professor Chris Brack is going to give us a presentation on tree gastronomy as part of Canberra Tree Week, which is on this week. Uh, there's heaps of events happening and, and still many more to come this week, so I encourage you to go to the Civil Services website and have a look at our calendar of events and see what else you might want to get involved in. So without further ado, I'm getting hungry, so hungry. take it away, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Uh, technology's going well. Okay. So, welcome everybody. Um, I'd also just like to acknowledge the in, um, Indigenous custodians of this land, past, present and emerging. Um, and particularly tonight, to think about how they survived in this land. And we're going to be looking particularly at survival um, and food and meeting your food needs. This talk is actually part almost of a dare. Um, one of my students once told me that I thought all problems could be solved by treats. And so I said, yeah, they probably can. Um, at least there's a tree-shaped spot in the answer to every human problem. And that, was my, that was my opening statement in response to that student. And she said, oh, all right, how can trees solve starvation? I said, oh, that's an easy one. So this, Here's how trees solve the food problems we've got. They don't solve the technology problems, but they hopefully will solve some of our food problems. So what I thought I'd do, I'd start with the pyramid of needs. You've all seen, seen this and how we step up. So we have our physical needs to start with, and that's uh, security, social ego, and self-actualization. I reckon trees have got a spot in every one apart, every part of that triangle. But we're gonna start right at the bottom, the physical needs we have. And here, they're listed as air, food, and water, and health. But I wanna deal with air, food, and water, or air, water, and food in that order. And what I particularly like about this is wood, which is part of the definition of trees, it's basically just air and water. That's all it is, CO2 and water. Put them together, add a bit of sunlight, get a miracle, and you get wood. You got wood, you got a tree. So we're gonna start there at how trees solve this really basic physical need we have as humans. So let's go right back to the beginning. <coughs> that is gonna annoy us, that thing on top, isn't it? Drag it around somewhere. Move it off screen, let's see. Yeah. Oh, there you go. There we go. Right, thank you. So, <laughs> it doesn't matter where we start, if you start with evolution, or start with creation, trees were there first. Trees and a um, tree of knowledge, a tree of good and evil, or just trees full of fruit. So, they were there and they provided food pre humans. So, they've been there for a long time. So let's see about where food has come from and goes to in respect of trees. Okay. Maybe we won't. What are you doing, Pete? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> so now it works again. All right, we'll leave it down there. Yeah, I think that is going to be the best for us to do. So we'll start, obviously, with fruit. So if we're going to start our meal tonight, we'll have a fruit starter. 
that's a nice thing to start with. It's something nice and sweet, revitalize the palate, gets it ready, but also it's attractive. It looks pretty. And I thought I'd talk a part of making food look pretty. Sorry. Part of what chefs do these days is make their food look attractive. So it's important to have attractive food because it's actually better for, you, for your digestion. Well, I thought I'd give you this nice little image of the artist, Sam Van Aken, who graphs things. So this is one of his installations. It's 40 different fruit trees grafted onto the one fruit tree. So that thing flowers 40 different fruits in, in their season. So this I thought was an interesting way of starting our meal. It's something nice and simple. So, fruit. All flowering trees produce fruit, um, but we talk about fruit as stuff normally consumed by humans. So basically, your fruit ripe and those reasons the flowers containing one or more seeds. This is a definition. Any humans eat it, it's fruit. If they don't eat it, it's just a ripe and ovary containing seed. So we normally talk about it only um, when it gets the label of fruit when it's people eating it. How many varieties of fruit are out there? Anyone guess? Very brave of you not to guess. We don't know, and if we did know, it'd probably be changed by now. We breed them like you wouldn't believe. But what I thought I'd do was give you a very quick run through. See how many of these fruits you can identify. These are well-known fruits. You can buy probably all of them in Australia. We have, they're not all grown in Australia, although we've got massive range of um, uh, climate, we can grow an awful lot of these ones. Now don't get confused. There's an awful lot who look like apples. They're not all apples. There's over a hundred, uh, over 120, 150 varieties of apples. There's six dominant commercial ones, but people are breeding apples all the time. They're not all oranges either. But an awful lot look like oranges as well. So we've got nice hairy fruits and nice smooth fruits, big fruits and little fruits. Whole range of colours of fruits. There you go. You're identifying them all. I'll give you a hint. They're in alphabetical order by their common names. Okay, there we go. Who got them all? <laughs> Who got five? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right, there's 30 went up then. So if you're interested, uh, I just picked this list out of Wikipedia. I said, tell me 30 fruits, bang, they gave me 30 fruits. So that's what's out there, listed out by the quarter. Again, by their common name, we end up with water apple. That's this one here. Um, oh, sorry for this one. The ugly fruit. That's this one here. It doesn't look that ugly to me, but there you go. We had to keep it that one because we needed to use somewhere. So that's why the ugly fruit's there. So that's just 30 that you can probably buy in Australia. You might have to go to specialist Asian shops or specialist tropical shops to get some of them. But most of them are available now. All right, let's have an easy question then. How many fruit trees are in the world? Okay. 
Um, the FAO uh, made an estimate um, a couple of years ago, and they came up with 22 million fruit tree orchards across the world, and their estimate of 37 billion fruit trees across the world. That's not bad. What's the population of the world at the moment? Seven-ish billion, maybe eight billion. So we've got five trees each on average. Should keep us going for a little bit. By this stage, most people have gone, ah, yes, but what about berries? What about berries? Fruits are basically divine, divine into fresh, fleshy fruits and dry fruits. So your dry fruits are your nuts. Your fleshy fruits are the other ones. And then the fleshy fruits are divided into simple, aggregate, or multiple fruits. That's the technical definition. Berries are just one of the simple fruits. That's all it really is. So all berries are fruits, but not all fruits are berries. And yes, that's a berry. So if you ask your kids ask for a piece of fruit and you give them one of those, you're right, but you're actually giving them a berry. The interesting thing is we have, as I said, huge history with fruit. We've been eating it forever, we've been breeding them forever, and we've got a real mutualistic association with fruit. There's a lot of fruits who can no longer survive without humans being involved. Um, we've been breeding these things so they don't have viable seed anymore, so they can't look after themselves. I'm not sure if technically they're fruit anymore, because that's part of it. They've got a seed in them. So the fruits need us, we need the fruit, but there's a mutualistic uh, relationship. So both are winning in that relationship. So there you go. There's our start. Some combination of those things, if you want sweet, sour, sharp, dull. What do you want to do to start your menu dull? What's our next course? Leaves. Let's eat some leaves. Edible leaves. There's a lot. There's not as many as there are fruits. And some leaves are actually poisonous if you eat enough of them. Normally you'll throw up well before that. You can eat eucalypt leaves. You won't keep them down for very long. But the young, very fresh eucalypt, you could shoot them if you really wanted to. There's no goodness for humans, but they're there. But there are leaves that you can eat. And there's whole recipes out there these days of a tender leaf salad. So start yourself off with some beech or some birch or some Chinese elm, get the young ones, stir them up into a nice mixed salad, and there you go. There's a nice little introduction to, to your second course, a nice salad here. Here's your cake, you know. Some of them taste better than other ones. You have to adapt your taste to some of the bitter, more bitter ones. This is also why the eucalypts don't go really well. Eucalypts have been fighting a battle with insects for millennia. Um, so they pump poisons into themselves to keep the insects away, the insects work out to cope with it, and come back and the leaves get better. So some of our eucalypt leaves um, are not as tasty as some of the other ones. But there are some very nice leaves out there. And the Petunus nissus, called the fragrant spring tree in Asia, it's one of these ones that's a common stir fry ingredient. They make some nice things apparently, um, there's particularly uh, what's called stir-fried eggs with leaves, they tuna leaves, um, and it looks like stir-fried egg with spinach. And apparently that's not an unusual breakfast to have in some of the Asian countries. Um, unfortunately, again, our little miscreant tag tells you its other name. So in the US, this is thing also exists, and over there it's called the beef and onion plant. So we have a nice fragrant spring or beef and onion plant. So apparently you, you eat that over in the US as well. So there's a diversity of things you can try. Second course, quite easy. Nice little light salad. What about bark? Who's eaten bark? Well done. Most people don't realize you can eat bark. What's the obvious bark you eat? Cinnamon. Everyone knows cinnamon. It's bark. Okay. What else can you eat apart from cinnamon? 
who's eaten something else apart from cinnamon and bark? No one? Not very adventurous. Bark used to be a primary source of flour. So in medieval time, your bread was likely to be made of bark. So you can have even the, the outer bark, the dead bark, ground up properly will make bread. The living bark inside makes nicer bread, they say. But you can eat the inner bark of most species. Don't get much out of it. It's good chewing gum. But there's some interesting things in it. So this is um, a pine bark dough ball to be made into bread. Uh, they have to add yeast and things, but you can do it. Um, this is flatbread made of birch bark. And in the Nordic countries, you know, grasses weren't around all year, and many seeds weren't around all year. They just make your bread out of bark. So it's not unusual in the past. We've been dominated so much now by wheat and grain. We now have gluten intolerant people, all those sorts of things who are eating wheat. But if you have bark, there's no gluten in bark, you can make bread out of bark. There have been some recent interesting findings that some of this bark has some very interesting chemicals, the prostyanidins, um, the aromic carbohydrate, uh, sorry, aromic hydrocarbons. They have some interesting medical properties. They have some interesting antibacterial properties. So there are people out there now trying to get you on the health values of eating bark. So it does work. It can give you something. So there's our nice little bread to go with your meal tonight, a bit of bark. Uh, you can make bread from other things too. Um, mostly we make bread out of effectively grass seeds, wheat, that sort of stuff. But the Aboriginal people, the Indigenous people of Australia have been making bread since the pyramids, since before the pyramids were built. They, all, they did use grass seeds, but they also used wattle. And we know that because we've actually found ovens, not just bacon on a hot stone, but ovens with wattle bread in them. So we know we have the oldest baking civilization on the planet here in this country, and I'm claiming that it was tricks that they were cooking. <coughs> So very quickly, there's a run through. Humans have been eating trees for millennia. They've been the fundamental source of very, very early humans, even the proto-humans, the fruit diets, bark diets, leaf diets. We still eat fruits, not so much bark and leaf. So we've been doing it for thousands of years, but not wood. Why don't we eat wood? What's wrong with wood? Well, it's obvious. Most of wood is cellulose and lignin. We don't deal well with cellulose and lignin. We can't digest it. We need a much bigger colon, huge appendix, all these sorts of things to get rid of. Until now. Now we can eat wood. I'll give you this tree. Chacaracea spinosia. Um, this is an Argentinian tree. It looks similar to our bottle tree. Um, I don't know if we've actually tried this with our bottle trees, but this tree was a staple of the Argentinian indigenous people. It grows to a maximum height of about 15 metres. It's a real life tree. The way the Argentinians used to do it is they would stick a stick in here and water would come out. Very similar to our bottle tree. And they drink the water. So it's a nice big water reservoir in the middle of their jungles. But we've also been looking at the wood. This is the wood. It has the lowest cellulose 
ratio of any wood of any tree. We're talking 10, 5, 10%. Most trees, 30 to 50% of the wood is cellulose. We're right down at 5 and 10. The cells are huge voids, they have a tiny wall around them. So they make great sponges, which is why they're full of water, and you can fill them up. But they're great sponges for all sorts of other things as well. So this is edible wood. And you can literally just eat it. You don't cook it. You don't need to prepare it. You can eat it straight out of the tree. Um, you can also grind it up and add it to things. But because it has these huge voids in them, it soaks up stuff really well. So this particular one is wood soaked in honey. Honey from, hopefully, from trees, from bees. But you can also soak it in maple syrup. You go into another tree based product for you. So soak it up in maple syrup and eat wood directly. Now, okay, maybe it doesn't sound all that exciting, but Argentina, Argentina has the same top celebrity chefs as the rest of us do. And they do things like this. These are wood-based desserts. That's wood. That's um, cinnamon-encrusted ice cream. I think we've got some bark in there. Uh, these are wood. There's a, there's a plum. That's a wood-based or tree-based thing. Um, so, and there's, that one's got um, walnuts in it. So you're actually eating wood with other wood, with other tree-based products in there. These were their finalists in their Top Chef Awards. So you can get some really fantastic tree-based desserts in there. And if you don't have a sweet tooth, particularly, have it a cheese platter. One of the other entries in this competition was a cheese platter, which was cheese on a wooden board. No crackers, because when you cut your cheese, you kept going and cut the board and ate the lot. The board plus the cheese. So there you go. There's a lovely way of finishing your dinner. Hmm. Might have forgotten something there. What are domains? So we had fruit, we had our salad, we had our dessert and cheese platter. What about mains? But let's have a, a nice noodle or possibly some ramen and some pasta and some dumpling base too. Because that's a really good healthy food. We already know that noodles are rich in fiber, low in calories, low in carbohydrates. No, they don't. That's not what noodles and ramen and pasta and dumplings are. Huh? You want to know how many carbohydrates? Or in a pound of wheat that makes up pasta or noodles. There's about 1,600, 1,700 1, kilojoules of carbohydrates in a pound of flour that's going to make it these things. So there's a lot, sorry, there's a kilos of calories. But these ones, are made, who can guess what these are made from? <laughs> pulp, paper pulp. Who wants to guess who made this? This is a little trick, yeah? Who made edible paper pulp into noodles? A clothing factory in Japan. Because this Japanese clothing company, I'm not going to pronounce it, thank goodness it's all hung behind me, so you, don't, you won't know it sound bad if I try to pronounce it. They make rayon. Rayon is wood-based clothing. You take pulp and you squeeze it out and you stuff it. Rayon is really, really popular in, in Japan, particularly, but in Asian countries as well. It's made of wood pulp. And then they found out, if you cut it up fine and do a few things with it, you make noodles 
which are rich in fiber, low in calories, low in carbohydrates, gluten free, and free from fat. So it's edible. It's the basis of your meal. So maybe we could stir fry this up with, I don't know, coconut milk and some beef and onion leaves. Oh, if you really had to do it, let's get a mushroom and throw that in as well. And there's your mains. Nice, healthy mains to go with your other food courses. How are we going? Ready for an after dinner drink? Well, we'll go back to bark. In the Middle Ages, bark made beer. If you drank beer, you drank bitter, and you drank bark based bitter beer. So we actually had fights over who owned the trees to get that bark to make the beer. Our palates have evolved, and what we call bitter beer these days is nothing like the bitter beers of those days. So maybe we wouldn't do it anymore. But now we're making new beverages out of wood that taste much nicer than those things. They, they reckon they taste as nice as alcohol has been aged in wooden barrels, like our best alcoholic beverages, and they're making them out of wood. So this is a, a research area in, uh, again, in Japan, and they can create almost four litres from almost four kilograms of sealant. The difference is we've been making alcohol out of wood for a long time. You pump it, you make it hot, you add some very nasty chemicals, and you get biofuel, uh, alcoholic biofuel, run your car off them. You can't drink them, apart from the fact they're really terrible tasting, they're toxic. But these guys start to do with that technique. And they make wood-based drinks that taste of the underpinning wood. That one tastes like um, cedar. You can taste like birch. You can taste you know, Chinese elms. And then making them. Um, that's a particularly high alcoholic content. That's up where up there with sake. So, yeah. You don't speak to any sarcasm, but this thing is the same sort of thing. So they're getting up there with those sorts of drinks. Um, because they're not using heat, they're looking at a different way. We're making alcoholic, palatable drinks to go with our four course meal. I love this one in particular. The researchers who did this work for the Woods and Forestry Research Organization of Japan, and they're doing things like you know, alternative <coughs> fuels and and other ways of doing these really important things. And they gave them two hours every week to just do stuff. Just explore, do some experimenting, have some passion, have some dream-inspired research. So what does any researcher in forestry do? They dream of drinking, apparently, and they came up with this new way of making alcoholic beverages. So there's, there's my dinner. I've got four courses. I've got a cheese platter to follow. I've got some nice, hopefully nice wine or nice alcoholic thing to go with it. Uh, and if I've given you too much, how about a doggy bag to take your leftovers home? So here's a nice little doggy bag. Um, if you can pronounce it, you can have it. The nice thing is it's not plastic. Um, it's made from wood. Um, also from shellfish, this shellfish, you know, um, crayfish and the lobsters and the crabs, crunch the shells up, mix it up with the, with the wood pulp, and you get this really interesting water-resistant paper, which you can wrap your food in. So you can wrap your food in it, and if you're so hungry, you can eat it still wrapped. <coughs> so they're now making vending machines in Japan. Everything's in Japan, they've got vending machines for everything. Well, bending the scenes with sandwiches, and well, probably not sandwiches, they don't eat, tend to eat sandwiches so much, but Japanese food wrapped in this stuff in your vending machine. It keeps it fresher than plastic, um, and you can eat it. There's some interesting combinations between these, the physical properties of these, and fat. Yes, the fat is absorbed into the paper and doesn't come out. So even when you eat it, you don't get the fat. So your diet is better by eating the wrapping of the paper. Now I've heard people say that about McDonald's. 
the most nutritious thing at McDonald's is the cardboard box that comes in. This is getting out there. It's also completely um, compostable, so if you don't eat it, you can chuck it away and it will totally decompose, unlike plastics which just break up into small pieces of plastic. So you can get increased shelf life, healthier, faster, wrapped food. Eating trees, though, has traditionally been thought as a famine food. Now, apart from fruit and berries, obviously they're not, they're not famine foods. But it used to be if you're so poor, you'd go out into the forest and you'd find something to eat. And if you couldn't find you know, anything, you'd gnaw the bark off the tree or you'd eat some leaves and some twigs. So it was a famine food, and we know that. If you actually go back to uh, the beginning of the, of the great democracy, in, in, the, in England, with the signing of the Magna Carta, which gave all people rights and all those sorts of things, alongside that book was a return of the rights of the people to go to the forest. It had all been taken over by the kings and the royals, what have you. The Magna Carta did all sorts of things for that, but the other book that went alongside it was returning the rights of the people to go back and survive in the forest. You still weren't allowed to kill deer, but still the kings. You still weren't allowed to hunt, that was still something else's. But you could run you know, 1.5 pigs on there, or you could capture nuts, um, fuel wood and things like that. And you could eat the treats. You had that right return to you. So theoretically, because we've evolved from the British system, we have the right to eat the treats in Australia as well. I don't know if we've ever tried, but we might. But normally you only did it if you were starving. And that's because there's so little digestible carbohydrates, fats, or proteins in the stuff. There's other good stuff in there, but not too much. There are exceptions. Sometimes eating a tree was really, really valuable. And it was actually prestigious to eat a tree. Again, in the Nordic countries, <coughs> if you baked birch bread and gave it to the other people, boy, you had some wealth. You were really, really wealthy, really, really respected, because birch bread meant you had access to a birch forest. So if you want to show off how wealthy you were, give your neighbours, your vassals, your peasants, birch bank bread. The nice thing about tree-based foods is they're there when you need them, and when you don't need them, you get more. It's a self-regenerating, Lager. It just sits out there in the cut itself and gets bigger. There's more wood, there's more bar. The leaves will reach an uh, equilibrium point. But it's there. It was self designed lager. And we're now also working out there's some other interesting things. We don't need carbohydrates and fats in our foods. We've got plenty of those. But there's some other interesting nutrients in parts of the tree. And we're only just starting to work out what, they, what there's what's there for us. Which brings me to the other problem of food that trees will fix. We won't fix famine. In Australia, we don't have that much famine. There are poor people who are below the poverty line who aren't eating, but our problem is more likely to be obesity. So we eat more than we need to, and it's an increasing problem all around the world. But you can fill up on noodles with a tenth of the calorie or less than noodles you buy in a normal shop. So you can still eat, you can still eat interesting foods and not get fat. Don't go too far, but there's nutrients in them. And if you mix them with the right other sorts of foods, you'll get an interesting meal. And it solves or goes some way to solving the obesity epidemic in the Western cultures. Oh, and that's the last one. You probably can't quite see that in there. One of the big hassles we have with massive rice farms and wheat farms and things is you've got to intensively manage them and you're always working on them. And you've got to have an eye to appreciate the value and attractiveness of a wheat farm. Well, it's out there. 
driving in the breeze. Yeah, that's fine. It gets a bit boring after that. Go to a forest, it's always attractive. It has a whole bunch of associated goods and services while it's growing. So grow your larder, solve your epidemic of obesity, and have an attractive thing that other plants and animals enjoy in your factory. So the other thing I just want to finish, so that's humans eating the tree. We can eat it all, not every part of every tree, but over the population of trees, we can eat, we can have reasonable meals over everything. What else eats trees? Well, obviously there's a lot of other things that eat trees. Uh, leaf eaters, they so make interesting patterns out of our trees. Um, if you study almost any eucalypt leaf, it's got a hole in it. These guys have chewed it away. You have some interesting ones. These are the, this is a skeleton riser. They can make some really attractive artistic works while they eat these things away. Um, and if you've got interesting jewellery, uh, there's a whole bunch of places who wait for a good skeletonized leaf, dip it in silver, and you sell it for a small mint on the internet. And of course, these guys eat leaves. We have a number of marsupials eating our leaves. Uh, it's still amazing to me with the efforts the eucalypts go to stop you eating them, and the efforts our insects and mammals go. To work out how to eat them. We're still learning a lot about these guys. You know, when, I, when I was doing my forest review way back when, it was still a story that you could, the koalas ate two or three versions of eucalypts. That was it. And if they couldn't eat those two, they were starving and dead. These guys eat a lot, and they, they have some very interesting patterns. Um, we have eucalypts of Dimonales, which is one of their preferred species, but they can tell where the Dimonales come from, and they can tell how. The chemicals in these ones are slightly different to the other regions. So I'm always studying the manas in the Monero. The koalas will eat the manas in the Monero, but only once every three to four weeks. They'll come down from the ranges, have a good feed down here, and then head up the ranges and eat the manas up there. Because they actually taste different. And the reason they taste different is they've got different chemical defences to down here. And these poor guys know that if they overfill on the human ass in the Monero, they're in trouble. So they go up the north, up to the mountains, and try the different ones. The reason I was studying that is because this guy's distant cousin ate all the human ass in the Monero. So, um, was you get weevil? That's not a weevil, but it's you get weevil, natural to the area. For some reason, you still don't know why. Its population exploded and they ate every single leaf of the Dimonalis in an area. A massive diet in Africa. And then as suddenly as they came, those weevils disappeared. We think the Dimonalis are coming back, hopefully, which means these guys might come back as well. What else do we eat? Well, wood. Everyone knows what this is? Who knows what this is? The tree I'm talking about. Scribbly gum. Yeah, of course. It's the, this guy, bark wheel. He actually eats the dead bark, sneaks in behind dead bark and live bark, eats in there. No harm to the tree whatsoever. Makes interesting patterns. This guy, not so. He's eating the living bark. And he does this insect tranches through there. So, yeah, they eat through. Um, Matt Brookhouse is looking, he's got a lovely ball beetle, it's one of these ones. But they go this way. That's a real problem because they girdle the trees. Um, and once you girdle the tree, it's also called a ring, a ring bark borer, because it's like ring bark in the tree. You take all the living bark, put it around, do the thing, disconnect the roots from the leaves, and the tree's dead. And there's a whole bunch of die back in the mountains caused by that. Again, it's a natural insect, but it's a problem. However, just to give you the full circle of life, we can eat the things that eat the trees. And there is now a growing movement of people who want to eat insects. There's at least 60 different Australian insects you can eat. The number one preferred insect is the wichita grub. More than 20% of people in Australia will be prepared to or have eaten the wichita grub. Tastes like chicken, apparently. Um, but there's a lot of other ones you can eat. Uh, this nice actor is eating a diversity of grubs, including mealworms, 
sound appropriate. Um, I think that's peanut butter. So if you, who likes peanut butter? Who wants to hear a story about peanut butter? <laughs> peanut butter can legally contain up to 7% insect and still be called pure peanut butter. So the chances are you're already eating insects. Just get used to it. And of course, we've got things that eat the dead wood, a decay fungi. We've got some very pretty ones. Oh, sorry. So uh, this is called um, chicken of the forest. That apparently is a quite an attractive and well sought after one. Um, I can't tell you what this one's called for, another attractive one. They're, they're edible, they're quite nice. Make sure you know who you're talking about before you eat the fungus that they're eating. But again, they're eating the tree and you're eating them. This is what they're doing inside the tree. So this is the pretty body of stuff that causes this. So we've got ants and white ants and fungus and bacteria in there. That's doing this inside the tree and then they punch the pruning bodies out here for the next generation. So we have, here's your full circle of life. Plant the trees, we eat them, or someone eats them, and then we eat someone who ate the trees. So I was, yeah, that's the basics. I've got another four stages left to go, and I'm hoping there'll be another four ACT tree weeks. And over the next four years, I'll run you up to the top of that hierarchy of needs, because that's an exciting one. Self actualization of the tree. So that you can come back in four years' time and I'll fix that. Thank you. Anyone not going to eat peanut butter anymore? <laughs> Any questions, comments? Chris, you didn't talk about the table. You may have a question. Which table? The table where you're in the middle. Well, I'd have to make it a plastic, otherwise you might eat the thing. Yeah. Be careful. Yeah. Or you probably should, we could make stand-up food and you hold your paper plate and then you eat it at the end of the meal. Yeah. I have a suggestion for after dinner. We could have coffee and tea. I have this Baltic cookbook and you can grind apple and things coffee and make tea from things like nettle. Yep. So I don't know if it's tasty or not. There are, again, if you're interested in that, there's a whole diversity of, you know, if you go into, into some of the alternative food uh, organisations, you, know, you can make tea out of almost anything. Um, I was trying to stick to trees, but yes, nettles and weeds and dandelions and all sorts of things are commercial tea crops. Yeah, acorn coffee, yeah, apparently it was big in the war because we couldn't get real coffee. And as soon as the war stopped, you get real coffee in there. Acorn <laughs> coffee. Uh, and I think the Indigenous Australians made a coffee type of you know, brachypine seeds as well. Yeah, I mean, again, Australia is an old continent and the plants here had a long time working out how to stop other things from eating. So they have this massive array of techniques and, te and, and strategies to stop being eaten. But the indigenous people have worked out how to eat them anyway. Um, if you just go to the botanical gardens and walk up some of those places and go, you know, the Aboriginals you know, made, you know, flatbread out of this. Oh, that's, that's interesting. And then you read what it took to make flatbread. The number of washings and poundings and heatings and rewashings and poundings and turning around three times. I don't know. I don't know how they invented it. I must have pointed an awful lot of people to work out the final strategy. So there are ways of surviving by eating the native fauna in Australia. It sounds like it's much easier in the US where you can Almost every corner bookshop will tell you how you can survive in the hardwood forest and the pine forests of western or eastern US and just wander off and glean food for a while. But yeah, you can do it. It's possible. I'm just curious if the um, the rayon noodle uh, is actually commercially available. Yes, it is. It is. Um, Sam actually found me a, um, a shop up in Gungahlin, which sells oh, like it. Yeah, it is locally though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'll get back to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, we eat a lot of noodles in the Right. Yeah. No, it's it's locally though. It's it is it is wood and the shellfish, but it's yeah, it's definitely wood and shellfish mixed to do that that round. So make sure you're not allergic to shellfish because it is shellfish, shellfish shell. 
So will you come to the dinner if I organise a four course dinner? Yes. Yes. Taking bookings, I haven't got a restaurant yet, but I'm hoping to encourage a restaurant to take up the challenge. No, none online? Uh, no online questions. Um, post it through if someone does want to ask it online. But um, we, oh, we have, we have a comment. That was great. <laughs> that was from uh, Maddie Shelby. All right, Maddie, yes. Um, so, yeah, I would say we'll take up your uh, bathroom uh, cooking first. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I've stunned you. Thank you.